So, Alexander, how do you really and feel about Steve? While I'm diagnosing my audio, <laughs> would you give us the great honor of starting out our meeting with your lovely smiling face and all of our friends, okay? It must be the Viking hat. I'm not sure. So you it's go the right. tinfoil. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's interfering. I think Stephen needs think to Stephen start, needs you know, to like, start, a, you know, like a transcript. Yeah. And then he can read it. <laughs> okay, we're going to start then. <laughs> Stuart, do you want to start? Yeah, yeah, I'll go. So, <laughs> hi everyone. Uh, so, Stuart Green, uh, known as Carbon 60 on Solar Chat. And uh, I've been very, given a great opportunity to talk about um, magnetometry. Uh, oh, hang so, on a minute. Is everybody oh, else getting bad reverb? Yes. yes. Getting a, um, a, yes. Like a double. I wonder There's if. A bit of echo. Yeah, it's like an echo. Everyone mutes themselves except that it's sure that it should be fine. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Okay. Right, we'll do that. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah, Brian. Yes, and I am back in okay. now. Okay. I'm on my cell phone in the bush making syrup. I've got to look, jump out for a minute and fix a pump, and I'll be back. <laughs> yeah, you keep it flowing, Brian. Okay, right. I'll try and share my screen. Hopefully, this. Let works. me make you a uh, co-host so you can do that, Stuart. Um, oh, okay. There you go. You're a co-host. Don't do anything funny, though, buddy. <laughs> try not okay. to. And there you go. Okay. Awesome. Let's get that uh, into slideshow, hopefully. There we go. Can everybody see that? Yes, Thanks. it's perfect. Thank you. Good. Okay, so space weather and geomagnetometry. <laughs> Bit of a mouthful, but um, yeah, it, it is what it says. It's about measuring the magnetic field here on Earth um, as a result of space weather. Um, Strictly speaking, it's variometry, um, but that's for the purists. And the reason for that is um, a magnetic field is um, it's a vector um, quantity. So if you think of X, Y, and Z, or Z, um, you can measure the magnetic field strength in the three different orthogonal directions and, um, and calculate the, the actual field strength um, uh, as a vector. Um, so variometry is uh, measuring the field strength in one particular direction, and um, we're focusing on the east-west magnetic field strength. Um, so as I say, strictly speaking, it's variometry, but I'll continue to call it magnetometry because that's what I've been doing for the last 10 years. Um, I don't see why I should change now. <laughs> okay, so... <clears throat> This is a typical example of a um, chart that I create using my equipment. Um, along the x-axis, we've got time, and this is over one complete day cycle. So midnight through midday through to midnight, uh, February 21st, 2023. Um, it says here it's the east-west magnetic field vector, which I've just explained. And then I've got my location, Preston, Lancashire, UK. So I'm in the northwest of England. On the vertical axis, the y-axis, we've got um, a measure of field strength in that particular uh, vector um, direction. And these equate pretty much to um, nanotesla. Now I've lost, there we go, nanotesla. Uh, which is a measure of uh, of the field strength. It's actually the um, flux density, but um, uh, that's by the by. We've got um, zero along the middle and uh, positive values upwards and negative values downwards. And what that means is the more positive the, the, the signal, the more easterly, if you like, uh, you'd see the compass needle moving. So if you look on the right hand side, you see the compass needle. Uh, and as we know, they, they point uh, to the north. During geomagnetic events, particularly strong events, this needle would move side to side, uh, eastwards or westwards, 
Um, but the effect is really tiny. Um, you'd be very hard pushed to, to see a compass needle moving during any sort of uh, geomagnetic uh, event. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so you need a special piece of equipment to do that, and that's what I'm going to talk about uh, this afternoon, or this evening, or this morning, depending on where you are. Okay, so um, we're going to talk about the cause and effect of field variations, which um, primarily space weather, Earth's magnetic uh, protective bubble, the magnetosphere, aurora and substorms, which are uh, an effect of uh, uh, the the solar wind um, and then solar storms, uh, the solar wind and CMEs, um, which are in in some cases particularly strong, giving uh, high signals, which you'll we'll see some examples of. Uh, so that's like an introduction section, and then we'll get into the home built magnetometer. I'll, I'll describe um, the hardware, how I acquired the data. Um, any data processing, and uh, of course, I'll show some examples of, of results. Then we can have some questions and answers. Um, but feel free to ask anything during the, the course of this, um, if, if you wish, uh, or keep them to the end. Uh, it's up to you. Okay, so I apologize to those who know a lot of this already, but um, you know we're all starting from uh, different places on this journey. So, um, you know, some of this will be pretty obvious and well known to, to, to many, but to some of you, it might be uh, new and useful information. Um, so we'll, we'll, um, we'll, we'll take it as it is. <laughs> um, the solar wind, it's a constant um, force, if you like, from the sun. Um, solar particles, protons and electrons primarily. Um, and it's always there, but it's, it's always variable. Um, and that's what we're measuring with this device. A uh, typical solar wind in, if we if we call it the quiet period, um, maybe flowing at uh, 300, 400 uh, kilometers per, uh, per second. Um, so it's, it's uh, <laughs> pretty fast flowing, um, but it's pretty um, thin, if you like. There's uh, not a lot of density to, to the solar wind generally. Um, and uh, it, it is detectable in terms of the effect on uh, Earth's magnetic field, but not as, uh, not as much as when we've got some greater levels of activity, um, one of which could be a coronal hole, for example. Um, so here the solar wind is, is flowing uh, faster, 400 to 500 kilometers per second, maybe typical um, velocities for, for the solar particles. So here we've got a basically a, a hole in the um, uh, call it the sun's atmosphere, um, and if you look on this diagram, you can see magnetic field lines have been drawn in. So we've got some active regions here with closed loop field lines. The thing about uh, coronal holes is the the field lines are extended, so they they're, they're not closed loops, and um, that allows the, um, the the particles, protons, electrons, basically to um, to, to leave the solar environment at, at much higher speeds than uh, would be the case at, at, at solar um, when it's when it's quiet. Um, and then, lastly, we've got the coronal mass ejections, which we all know come from you know uh, highly explosive events. You might have um, flares or or collapsing um, filaments and so on, which can uh, cause material to leave the solar environment. Um, at, at very fast speeds, um, the material may be dense, and um, the, the the thing about uh, these sorts of events, the, the material can be uh, highly magnetic, and um, so it carries away, if you like, the, um, the sun's magnetic field, um, which which I'll come on to that because that's important when it comes to coupling between. The, uh, the solar and, and, and Earth's environment. So speaking of the Earth's environment, of course, uh, as everybody who, who's ever held the compass will know that the compass needle points north-south and that results from um, the liquid core uh, of the Earth uh, spinning and um, creating a, a magnetic field. Um, so the lower diagram here shows 
a uh, bit of a cartoon really of, of how the, uh, the field points. Contrary to uh, what most people will think, the North Pole of, we'll call it a bar magnet in, uh, along the, uh, the axis of the Earth there. I keep losing my pointer, there we go. Um, the north of the bar magnet is actually at the South Pole. So field lines run from south to north. Um, and uh, I think most people know that the magnetic axis is offset from the spin axis of the Earth. And this is, as I say, sort of a cartoon, really. It's a schematic of the magnetic field in an environment where there's no solar wind. So it's symmetrical. It's a beautiful symmetrical uh, magnetic field, uh, as, you, as you can see. The reality is quite different. Um, hopefully you can see that uh, on the right hand side there, where we've got the Earth. Um, and this beautiful symmetric ma magnetic field now is no longer symmetric. We've got solar wind coming in from sort of the, the, the top left, pushing against Earth's magnetic field and drawing out the field lines behind uh, in a long envelope be behind the Earth and squashing up the field lines in front. Um, and of course, the Earth's spinning within that. So any, any point on Earth will will see that difference in, in magnetic field um, as, 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 as the day progresses. OK. Um, and um, solar physicists have, and, and earth scientists have, have split this into different regions um, as they do. So we've got the solar wind. Um, we've got the bow shock where the magnetic field of the Earth is, is basically We'll call it pushing against the solar wind and the solar winds being directed around. Um, close to the Earth, you've got the plasma sphere. So um, Earth's plasma will be uh, contained within the plasma sphere. That's where you've got the Van Allen belts and so on. Um, <clears throat> and then you can see the long tail behind the Earth formed as a result of, of um, uh, in effect, the, the pressure of the solar wind pushing against Earth's magnetic field. Um, and it gets even more complicated than that when you look at the, the, the physics of it, and I won't go into this, um, but it, it basically shows that you get ring currents, um, cross-tail currents, field align currents. So, so all of this solar wind activity is really generating these electric currents um, out in space around the Earth's environment. And, and these um, themselves create magnetic fields which interact with Earth's magnetic field. So it's a, it's a real um, complex system. And I say that really just to show that, um, uh, you know, we're not just talking of two magnets coming together and pushing against one another. There's a lot going on uh, in terms of plasma physics uh, out, out in that environment. And the magnetometer really is... Um, it's, it's, it's down on the surface of the Earth, obviously. It's, I've got one in my back garden, um, but it's able to detect all these uh, effects um, resulting from the solar wind and the, um, the, the, the type of, um, or the, the power, the, the force, the, um, the velocity, and the magnetic field uh, carried by the solar wind, all interacting with, um, with the magnetosphere. Um, just just step back one in a lot of diagrams the solar winds always shown as these little vector arrows um all of the same length all in the same direction uh the reality uh, just to have more complexity is uh, something like this where the solar wind um it, it is not just a, a plain um pressure wave if you like pushing against this magnetic field it, it, it's complex there's a lot of complexity in here with these jets uh, of plasma coming in, um, really knotting up the, uh, the, the Earth's magnetic uh, environment. So, um, the, as I say, there's a lot going on, and the magnet magnetometer is really um, there to um, record at ground level um, the response to, to all of this activity. I mentioned before um, coronal holes. So here we've got the, the same diagram with the closed magnetic loops, the coronal hole and solar wind flying out. Now, I can't quite see the image on the right hand side. I hope you can, but um, I've got a, a series of uh, pictures of you guys <laughs> down the right hand 
side, but you can think of it as um, uh, the, the sun's rotating, it's squirting out this solar wind. It's a little bit like a garden sprinkler where you've got um, the thing rotating with, with water um, coming out of the, 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 the holes in the sprinkler, um, which from the top looks like this on the left. So um, you, you, if, if you could take a snapshot of the solar wind, you, you'd see this garden spring. Um, and the reason I'm telling you this is because the, the coronal hole is a region of fast flowing solar wind. So you've got this stream, if you like, curved stream of fast flowing solar wind, um, which catches up with the ambient solar wind ahead of it and causes this compression. And behind you get this uh, rarefaction, um, so less dense solar wind here, and then back to ambient solar wind. So this is spinning around with the sun, um, and as you get more or fewer coronal holes, you get more or fewer of these um, compression zones. Um, and these are detectable uh, on the magnetometer because this interacts with this um, the, the Earth's magnetic field. Um, through the processes that I've uh, just just described. So in terms of solar wind characteristics, there are a couple of satellites out there, at least a couple, but the ACE and uh, Discover satellites provide data to the um, Space Weather Prediction Center um, operated by NOAA uh, in the US. And um, the solar wind can be characterized in terms of these uh, different measurements. We've got BZ, which is the magnetic field direction of the solar wind, either pointing up or down, north or south. Um, so when the red line, I keep losing my mark for some reason. There we go. Where's my pointer? There we go. So when the red line is above zero, the solar wind is carrying a northerly um, direction uh, in terms of magnetic field. When it goes below zero, it's uh, in the southerly direction. And that's important as I'll, I'll come on to, um, to, to show you. Phi is really just the um, magnetic field direction, either pointing towards Earth or away from Earth. Um, density speaks for itself, typically um, around about 10 protons per cubic centimetre um, density, but that increases or decreases depending on, um, you know, how these compressions uh, are occurring or whether we get, we have a, a coronal mass ejection arriving or not. Um, speed, again, speaks for itself, typically in the quiet, as I mentioned, around about 300 kilometres per second rising as a result of the um, uh, the, the solar wind, uh, either from a, typically a coronal hole, hole or, or um, coronal mass ejection, um, and then temperature. Uh, and here at this line, we're up to, you know, a million degrees, but maybe t uh, tens or hundreds of thousands of, of degrees. But it's the density is so low that, you know, it's not as though it's we're, we're going to cook the earth with, uh, with those temperatures. Um, so, so we've got basically all this information from these satellites, um, the most important of which I found is this one, um, the, the measurement of BZ, um, as, as well as uh, solar wind speed. So um, just going on to well, why, why is BZ important? Um, it's about coupling, and um, I'll... I'll Come on to that a little bit more in a minute, but uh, as the solar wind presses against the or pushes against Earth's magnetic field, um, I mentioned the field lines behind Earth are stretched out. Well, these get compressed as the solar wind pushes against these, and um, uh, you get magnetic reconnection. It's like don't cross the streamers in um, Ghostbusters. <laughs> um, so when the stream is cross, i.e. that you get magnetic reconnection, um, then the uh, particles trapped within the field lines can be released and um, shoot back down the field lines into the polar regions, and, and that's when we see the aurora. 
And, and this can occur, uh, as it says here, as a geomagnetic substorm. So it doesn't have to be a, a fully fledged um, geomagnetic storm. These things can happen uh, at relatively low um, uh, or ben relatively benign conditions. So field line coupling, uh, as you've seen from my previous slides, it's all rather complicated in terms of the magnetic fields and how the, the field of the solar wind interacts with the uh, with Earth's magnetic field. So this is greatly simplified, but it, it does show the point. So let's imagine we've got the Earth's magnetic field here, north, um, down at the bottom, in the south of the, of the Earth, south pole. Um, so this bar magnet has its magnetic field lines, uh, as you can see. Now, if the solar wind comes in uh, from the left and uh, the field is aligned uh, in, in such a way as, as shown, then the two fields basically push against one another um, and uh, there's no linkage between the two. Um, whereas uh, if the field carried by the plasma solar wind oops, comes in from the left and it's aligned in this direction, so anti-parallel um, with the south down, um, then you get linkage between the field lines and basically um, solar wind or solar particles can then enter the Earth's uh, magnetic environment more easily than they can in the first uh, condition. Uh, and, and that's when you start to get um, uh, very, very powerful um, magnetic storms. So this is in the, in the second case, that's where the red line on the data would be below zero. So you get that southerly um, oriented magnetic field. OK, so um, we now know that the effects depend on the speed the orientation, magnetic orientation, the density of the incoming solar wind, and it, these all interplay and, and um, interact with us magnetic field, depending on, on um, the, the char specific characteristics of the solar wind. So in terms of geomagnetic storms, then this is, uh, you know, where we, we start to see the impact of uh, CMEs, particularly, although they could be um, particularly large coronal holes or multiple coronal holes, but uh, CMEs tend to be the, the main um, cause of geomagnetic storms, or certainly the, the largest geomagnetic storms. Um, and, uh, you know, we I, I think we all know the origins of, uh, of um, CMEs and so on. But again, it, it, it's it, the effect, the strength of the geomagnetic storm depends on the characteristics that I've described. So you get very powerful ones um, or weak ones, depending on the uh, magnetic orientation and, and, and velocity and so on. And we characterize storms in terms of a, a, a G1 to G5 scale. Um, so G1 uh, minus storms, G5 extreme. Um, the majority of storms that I've detected are in this range, uh, I don't think, I, I can't recall over 10 years detecting a G4 and certainly not a G5. Um, and um, in parallel, you've got the, a, what's uh, called a KP. This is the um, interplanetary um, uh, K factor. So for minor storm, you might have a KP of, of five. Uh, up to KP of nine for a G, G5 storm. And what does that mean? Well, a, a KP of, you know, uh, the, the, the low KP factors um, the, on the planetary K index um, mean that the aurora, uh, subsequent aurora would be at fairly high levels um, for, for the north or further south. And as the storm's strengths increase, so the KP uh, values increase, and you can see uh, the aurora for fairly further south, uh, as was the case fairly recently over um, you know, large parts of the US and parts of the UK, where we saw um, G2, G3 activity. 
Um, and this is a simulation from uh, some, some work at NASA. I just wanted to show this because, you know, in solar calm, we've got, uh, you know, the protective bubble projecting forwards, tailing backwards, but under a, a, a really powerful storm, the Carrington level event, for example, um, you can see how much more compressed the, the um, magnetic field is on the, the sun side of the earth. Um, and then you, you've got a lot of reconnection on, in the tail and um, solar wind stream particles would be streaming in uh, and that would be a, a, a really significant uh, geomagnetic storm event. And, and that just shows you a visual of it. OK, so hopefully everybody's happy with that. Um, any thumbs up? Are we OK? Yeah, good. Excellent. All right, so now onto the home built magnetometer, uh, equipment, hardware, data acquisition, processing, and results. So um, at the heart of it is a magnetic sensor, as you might imagine. Um, and the key is to connect the magnetic sensor to a computer. Um, I, I've mentioned the the signals are really uh, very tiny. We're talking of uh, you know, 50, uh, 50 nanotesla um, signals, 100 nanotesla signals, compared with Earth's magnetic field, which is uh, you know, 50,000 um, nanotesla. So very, very small signal compared with the, um, the, the, the size of the Earth's magnetic field. So we've got to con connect the magnetic sensor to a laptop um, to to detect these these small signals, uh, and then we've got to not only detect them, but we've got to record them in some way. Okay, so um, the sequence I have, uh, and there, there are other ways of doing it, uh, no doubt. But uh, this, what I do is connect the magnetic sensor, which gives out a, a train of pulses at seventy kilohertz or thereabouts, depending on how you tune it. Um, to an ultrasonic emitter. So I produce physical sound from that sensor. Um, and then I convert the physical sound, which is ultrasonic, to audible sound um, so that I can use the computer sound card to then uh, detect the, aud um, the audible sound from which has been converted from these uh, ultrasonic pulses. And you might say, well, why, why do all that? Well, I was looking for a relatively straightforward way of doing it without having to build uh, uh, a lot of electronics um, myself. Um, I didn't want to spend a lot of money on it, so I didn't want to buy frequency converters and so on. I tried a few of the cheap ones, and they didn't really work very well. Um, and then these, they rapidly got very, very expensive, multiple hundreds of, of, of pounds. Um, so I've, I found a cheap way of doing it, and I'll, I'll show you what I've done. So this is a sensor. It's an FGM3. Um, these were available from uh, Speak, a company in, in Wales, um, but uh, that's no longer the case. Uh, they have been replaced by FG3, uh, and they're uh, over in Europe somewhere. I can't remember exactly where. Um, but basically, the the sensor has an alloy core um, with two coils, an excitation coil and a sensing coil. And basically you get a train of pulses out from the sensor, uh, feed it with a, a five volt voltage um, and you get a train of pulses uh, going up to five volts. Um, and the frequency of these pulses depends on the magnetic field strength. Um, so with reducing magnetic field strength, you get an increase in um, pulse rate uh, from, from the sensor. And, and as you move the sensor in a magnetic field, you would see if you had an oscilloscope, the pulse rate um, going uh, higher or lower than uh, the null point, as it were. So um, this is the ultrasonic emitter. Some of you may be familiar with these. Um, pretty straightforward. Uh, used in um, burglar alarms, you know, detectors and that sort of thing. 
um, or uh, one time they used to be used in TV remotes, they're still available. Um, so just simply putting the output from the sensor to this, I can create um, physical sound. Obviously it's ultrasonic, um, we can't hear it, but one of these can. Um, I know Ale Alexandra, you, you're perfectly familiar with these, a little bat detector, um, which seems a bit odd using a bat detector in a magnetometer, um, but forget that it's a bat detector, just think of it as an ultrasonic to audio converter, which is exactly what a, a bat detector does. So I feed the, um, the signal, which is now ultrasonic, a physical sound wave into the bat detector, uh, tune the bat detector, and I can create an output which comes out of the lead and into the sound card. So um, this is this is it in um, schematic form. <clears throat> so <clears throat> one of, one of the challenges with uh, these systems because the signals are very very weak compared with the um, strength of the Earth's magnetic field, they are very sensitive to changes in voltage and changes in temperature. So we've got to be very careful how we uh, regulate the voltage. So basically, I've got a, a little voltage regulator, a little circuit uh, here, which is um, converts a, a, a 12 volt DC uh, from a you know a typical supply um, transformer. Uh, nothing special about that but then it goes through uh, uh, th this little um, uh, voltage regulator to nine volts and then another voltage regulator to five volts um, and that's the output um, to the sensor um, and uh, some, some capacitors there just to uh, make sure we don't get any voltage spikes and so on so that's voltage regulation um, and then temperature management. So uh, I've taken all the, 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 the casing off the uh, bat detector. Um, I regulate the voltage to this as well. So that's another little voltage regulator there. Uh, put that inside a thermos flask <laughs> and then put that inside basically a, um, uh, a, a food, uh, what do you call them? It, 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 it's, a, it's a cool box. Uh, but it, in this case, it's it's a warm box because I'm running this at 27 degrees uh, and I'm using a heater map from uh, uh, a vivarium. So, so it's a, a bit of a mishmash of, of things from bats to um, iguanas to, to food. <laughs> but, but basically, all of this is about um, keeping the, the, the system at a, a pretty constant temperature. It's plus or minus half a degree on on uh, on the set temperature uh, which which is pretty consistent um the other important thing is sensor location um got to keep it away from um electromagnetic interference or from the road where you might get heavy lorries um you know a lot of steel passing uh, a, a magnetometer is not a good thing or railway lines with trains passing or the electrical system um uh, overhead on a railway line um, it shouldn't be an uh, overly uh, shielded with iron structures. Um, uh, basically, it should be quiet and remote. Um, so I've got mine buried underground. About uh, it's about eight hundred millimeters underground, um, and the sensor has to be kept dry, and it's uh, pointing east west. And so this is my house, um, and that's the sensor buried uh, under under the trees out of the way and that's the line going into the side of my house into the garage and um you know it's 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 remote you can see i mean it's just open fields here i can actually detect the farmer when he's cutting the grass but that's another thing so one of my terms, questions actually um, yeah. is uh, uh you're measuring east west is there a different signal you could measure north south or even up down or is it redundant yes. to east west so um, yes, the, the the signal can be measured in in all three orthogonal directions. That's perfectly possible, and people do that. Um, but uh, 
reading upon this years ago when I was looking first looking into it, um, the recommendations were to measure the east-west field vectors. So um, I, that, that's what I've done. Um, it's, and and it, I think it's a bit more sensitive in the east-west direction because most of magnetic field lines are pointing north-south uh, on Earth, obviously. Um, so any any smaller changes you can be more readily detected in the east-west direction does that, does that help yeah actually yeah. um uh i think where where we are in the uk they actually point quite a bit downward yeah yeah, <laughs> right? yeah, yeah exactly. actually at an angle they're, they're not exactly you know going across the surface of the earth they're actually no, exactly. That's pointed right. so so you're quite right if you're uh if you're East West, you probably have the minimum um, background. Exactly, that's right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, th thanks for your question, Douglas. Um, so, uh, just going back to the sensor, um, that's buried underground, and and that's to keep that at a fairly constant temperature. Um, and I found over the years, uh, I've tried a few things. Um, um, now I use copper pipe, twenty-two millimeter copper pipe. Uh, will fit the sensor and um and and that that's if, if copper pipe keeps water in it'll keep water out <laughs> that was my uh theory so uh it's all soldered up um with elbows and end caps and so on um and the uh uh voltage regulator is now inside a little um housing that's uh water resistant but that's now above ground. So that sits up here above ground. Um, and that seems to be working uh, really, really quite well so far. I had tried using plastic housings and I tried, well, a, a whole bunch of things over the years. They don't work. You you, you really need the uh, the barrier properties of, of a metal pipe to, uh, uh, to, to keep the water out. Okay, uh, I'm just aware of time. I hope everybody's okay with, with, with me carrying on with this. Uh, just a few slides now. Um, data capture. You take all the time you want, man. We got plenty of time. All right, cheers, Steve. Thanks for that. Um, <clears throat> so <laughs> going from the sensor through the um, ultrasonic emitter, through the bat detector, <laughs> into the sound card. Uh, on my PC, this is this is what you see, and this is um, a fairly recent one. It's the G2, uh, G3 storm, and that created a lot of excitement around uh, in the media because we had um, some pretty lights over the UK. If you had uh, clear views, unfortunately, we didn't. Alexander, we we were under uh, cloud here in the northwest. But anyway, so this is the this is a sort of uh, trace that you get using um, Spectrum Lab. Uh, I've got a, 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 a website here uh, that you can go to and, and look at this software. Pretty straightforward, uh, and I found it really useful. It's free as well, which all, always helps. Um, so I've got this set up uh, around about um, 5.9 kilohertz signal, uh, and then that varies uh, up and down depending on what's happening through this complex interaction between the solar wind and the magnetosphere and these ring currents and everything that's going on um, out in the uh, magnetosphere and, and uh, you know, the space environment around us, um, all of that is coming down at ground level, actually below ground level and, and um, making my little magnetometer twitch with these electrical signals which are detected on my computer. So very very satisfying when it all comes together um so then i take um a csv file um comma separated uh, variable file from um spectrum lab so i, I um download a file from the lab uh, the spectrum lab as it's still running uh, and this contains date time and frequency information uh, and then i can stick this into a spreadsheet um which does a lot of converting from frequency to nanotesla and some corrections and so on, um, and generates the charts. I haven't got the charts on here. It made it too wide to be practical on a, on a screen. Um, but this is 
um, this is the output from from uh, the Excel spreadsheet. So as per my first slide, I've got um, some date and time information, location, it's the east-west magnetic field vector, and then we've got these um, plus and minus variations or um, changes in, in uh, east-west magnetic field vector, uh, which I can I can record either in one second cadence or 150 second cadence or whatever I want to choose. I just change that in, in the software. Um, but the reason for showing you this is, you know, if I take a sample every second, um, you know, there's a lot of fine detail in this. And every, every wiggle means something. I don't know what it means, <laughs> but but it means something. And everyone is, is different. Um, every chart that I collect is, is different. Um, and it, it, it's different uh, depending on where you are on the Earth, whether you're on the sun side or the lee side, um, uh, whether you're in the north or the south. And, you know, the, the, these are fairly unique to uh, within certain regions of, of, of the Earth. Um, so the one second cadence gives a, a lot of detail. I tend to use the 150 seconds of so every two and a half minutes cadence because it, it, it's generally good enough. Um, you know, for what we for what we want to show, and it uses a heck of a lot fewer data points. Um, so, how does all this compare with professional uh, data? It's all right having this little instrument buried in my garden and fed through into my garage, into my lap, into my PC. But you know, does it does it really work? Is it is it is it providing anything useful and truthful? Uh, so, I use um, Intermagnet. Um, as a reference, particularly the, this one, Chambon La Forêt, in uh, just south of Paris. Um, and I think you can see here's my data. This is the professional data. Pretty much every peak and wiggle is reproduced um, between the two. So I'm extremely happy that um, the system's working fine um, and that I'm getting results that are uh, very comparable with. Um, professional systems. Okay, last few slides now. So, um, so far you've seen these types of charts. So we've got these arbitrary units, which pretty much closely match Nano Tesla, and I can use professional systems to just tweak and get um, a bit better calibrated. Um, but uh, I, I can also do a rate of change um, conversion. So I, I look at this and then um, do do uh, uh, basically differentiate the the uh, signal. So I get the rate of change, um, and that takes out um, some minor variations that are still occurring as a result of temperature changes. So if I do, for example, three days, four days a week, a month, or or a year then um, as you can imagine between summer and winter there's some quite considerable temperature changes and it's it's impossible even with a buried sensor to completely el eliminate the effects of temperature now you could say we can compensate for it and so on but uh, yeah you can or you can just do this do a rate of change and it keeps everything nice and straight and level because i'm just looking at changes and not absolutes so the g1 and g2 storms that we had uh, recently um, here's the data again, um, but here's the rate of change. Uh, so, so you you lose all of this um, in, in effect. You you just see the 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 changes uh, in terms of rates of rate of change. If that makes sense. Um, but it allows you, as I say, to do, for example, a monthly summary. If I did a monthly summary in this format, I would see um, uh, some changes resulting from temperature whereas if i do the rate of change i eliminate that and i can do a monthly summary uh, and and really these are the things that we're um, interested in just how, how does the signal vary over time um resulting from the activity of the sun and not the activity of of, of, of weather changes here um in my local environment so we can see the end of february um that's where we got the uh, solar storms and um, you can see that very clearly on on this type of chart 
or you can do it over a year. This is um, 2021. Um, and you can see the, again, the rate of change and the, um, the location in time of different events and how, uh, th well, this top chart is a rolling summary of this one, um, a, a rolling, um, uh, what's the word? Lost the word, but basically it, it's it's allowing me to take out all these um, uh, fine details and, and providing a, a rolling average. That's what I was looking for of of, of this data. Okay, so uh, tying it all together, basically we've we've got this little device that's providing these um, the, this output. Um, it correlates very well with the planetary K index um, and uh, with data from uh, ACE and the Dis Discover um, satellites where you can see, um, you know, when activity is increasing on my system, you, you start to see activity increasing on, um, uh, on, on satellite data. So basically you can tie it all together. So last slide, promise. <laughs> Uh, so it's a it's a complex mix of slow and faster moving high temperature solar plasma, protons and electrons, and magnetic fields. Um, and the characteristics change: speed, density, magnetic polarity of plasma impacting Earth's protective ma magnetic bubble, magnify uh, sorry, uh, modifies the magnetic environment here at ground level or slightly below ground level, um, and um, local magnetic field strength and variations in um, uh, in, of variations in search can be measured and recorded using home built magnetometer like it's variometer. So that's it. Hopefully, that was of interest. QAs. Sorry, Steve, can't, can't hear you, mate. I said I was really grateful for you taking all the time and doing all the work to present this to. It's totally new. You know, most people have. I've not done any of this. Um, and I, I often tell people in our, um, in my little outreach events that, you know, it's kind of like uh, mosquitoes around a street light. We live so close to this powerful source of light and energy and we feel every variation in it mm -hmm. and uh, everything that happens on this, on this star happens in our atmosphere. And this is just, you know, proof positive of that too. So, um, so are there some questions from anyone about the, uh, about the presentation. I have one, Stephen, if I can. Please. Um, is there any um, variation when there's a solar eclipse that is visible from your local position on Earth? Um, I, I'm not entirely sure about... Um, I, I mean, we've never had a solar eclipse, uh, you know, t certainly not a total one, <laughs> here in, yeah. in the UK since the um, 19... 1996 no. was it? 99. 99 was it? Yeah. Anyway, so uh, I can't answer your question because I don't have any data on that. Yeah. And I, I don't know what's published. I mean, there's there's probably something published on on that. Um, I mean, it's an interesting question. Uh, there's probably some effect. Uh, Along those uh, same lines, do you do you think that the effects are measured by your instrument? Um, if they happen on the sun at, at 1300, is the effect measured eight and a half minutes later? Does it travel at the speed of light from the sun? Does it travel at the speed of the particles? Uh, is there any delay right. time between the two? Yeah, it's a good question, Steve. So, uh, it, it all depends on the speed of the, of the wind. So, um, you know, typically, uh, CME may take two or three days to, to arrive, um, so, so it's carried along with the particle speed and not not yeah. uh, instantaneous with the speed of light because that's that's, that's, that's right. A, a big question that comes up, you know, if the sun were to theoretically disappear, yeah. how long would it take before we noticed? You know, <laughs> <laughs> this is a question I've always gotten from a lot of people. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So it it, it depends on the um, the the speed of the particles. Right. So the um, so the effect travels with the particle front. Yes, exactly. That's right. Mm. Uh, I've looked for, uh, 
if you have a, a strong, um, you know, X class flare, um, so sort of generating a lot of X rays, um, which will ionize our ionosphere. Um, I, I've looked for signals. I, I, I've never seen anything that I can absolutely correlate to uh, an event like that, um, which would be traveling at the speed of light. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it, it's only a little sensor in my back garden sort of thing. You know, professionals right. may, may, may have, uh, have some other information on that. I think it's pretty impressive. Um, it, in Tunisia, when I was there, there was a, a guy getting his uh, doctorate with a large coat hanger uh, stuck to a oscilloscope on the top of a building, and he was measuring sudden ionospheric disturbances and uh, attained his uh, his doctorate in physics with with about you know five dollars worth of metal and an old yeah. leftover an old leftover <laughs> piece of French equipment that was in the uh, in the university since the sixties. Right. So what you have is pretty impressive to me. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. Now that you've been doing it for a decade. Uh, you said, um, are there long-term uh, trends? Is there a sunspot cycle correlation or something like that? Uh, I'm, I'm sure there is. <laughs> uh, I, I've never got around to completely analyzing of, over uh, that uh, period of time. Um, I've done annual um, uh, plots, if you like. I, I showed you this one, for example. So I've got this for, I think I started in 21 or maybe 20. Um, I can't remember, but um, it, it, it's, a, it's a lot of data points to, to get through this. You know, every, every two and a half minutes, you've got a, a data point. Um, it takes quite quite some time to, uh, to, to pull this together. Um, but it would be nice to do this now for uh, going back all the years and then just seeing what what the trends are um i mean certainly you see uh, you know lo much lower levels of activity uh, during solar quiet um you know on the 11 um year cycle but it, it's odd because during uh, you know we, we, we've got um, sunspot numbers increasing um heading to solar max and you get more flares and more cmes but at the quiet period um you've got more coronal holes so mm -hmm. you, you still get events coming through um because of fast flowing solar wind from coronal holes um so you still get um you know the aurora and you still see um the effect on on a magnetometer um because you've got this fast flowing solar wind not coming from cmes but from coronal holes so discerning you know which, which is which you could look at a chart like this and you say okay well this was taken at solar minimum um but they're all because of solar uh, coronal holes and not not cmes um so, so I, I don't know if that answers your question i mean i haven't done it but uh i, I know that definitely you get different events at, at different parts of the cycle, but each of these contribute to some sort of signal coming through on the magnetometer. Can, can I can I jump in? Sure. Yeah. Hi, Pedro. Uh, you could use a time series analysis, maybe to to with all this data and try to see if you have any trends. It's not very difficult, but of course okay. it's a lot of data, but could be done. And also you have a gap in December. What's that? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, with the best will in the world, I want this to be up and running 24-7. Um, but sometimes, you know, things happen. Um, I've had uh, power outages from um, the, um, you know, the 12-volt the um, transformer supply failing or, or some other part of the circuit failing. Um, water ingress, that, that's quite a problem sometimes which is why I've gone to this uh, different system um and and sometimes it can take a little while to figure out what's going wrong and then correct it and test it and then uh, get back up and running again I lost the whole of January this year because of uh, a failure in the system 
and and I had to rebuild the power regulator, had to um, uh, excise, if you like, the uh, the system from underground, dig a hole, re retrieve it, dry it all out, um, and then uh, try a few different ways of um, keeping keeping the water out. And, and that's when I hit on using copper pipes and so on. Um, so, you know, you try and keep it running all the time, but it's not always possible. Okay, you, you you have a you have a new UPS or something like that to when the power goes off or if you don't have any power. Um, no, because no, you no. where I am, I, uh, the not that sophisticated. <laughs> no, no, no. It, I have cuts in electricity almost every week. So. Oh right, okay, yeah. Well, generally it's reliable. It's it's when a, a, a circuit um, it it doesn't burn out, but a circuit may fail um, for, for whatever reason um uh usually water uh, is is the culprit uh, and and as i say things have to be rebuilt and reconfigured or or, or whatever and, and you can lose a few, few days uh, as a result i was surprised to see that your signal was so similar to the signal in paris i would have thought it would be much more local uh, than that yeah no it it, it, it I mean, it, it was a su surprise to me when I was um, starting all this, um, but um, yeah, I mean, that that seems to correlate very well, um, almost 100% of the time. Um, but, you know, if I look at one in Hawaii, then it's a bit different, <laughs> you know, so the, the, the signals really are very different depending on uh, latitude, longitude, um, you know, but, but within that sort of region, it, it's quite um quite quite similar uh i have correlated um my signals with um the aurora a guy in sweden um sorry norway was um uh doing vi videography basically doing an animations of the uh, aurora borealis and i knew exactly at the start and end time uh, of his sequence, and I selected the data from that period, and then um, converted uh, my signals into sound, uh, sound of the solar wind, <laughs> whatever that might be. Um, but you can do anything with MIDI and um, music technology uh, mm -hmm. systems. So um, I converted signals into MIDI and then into sound, and then put the two together with the visuals of the aurora. And it sort of works, but you know he's, he's in Tromso, uh, and I'm in Preston, uh, so it's not going to be perfect. But uh, it, it, it made for a, you know, an interesting uh, dynamic bet between the two. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Would, would the signal be be greatest uh, in the areas where people typically see aurora borealis? Uh, generally, yes. Yeah, more northern latitudes tend to have higher signals than. Um, you know, if, if you're unfortunate to be on the equator, you probably don't see a great deal uh, from from this. But um, certainly, from the, the, you know, in in terms of different latitudes, the the signals vary um, quite markedly. And whether you're on the sun side or the the, the you know in, 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 on the dark side of, of the Earth, when an event occurs, you, you will see quite a different response. Hmm. Well, that's pretty awesome here. So, anyone else have any questions or anything? I well, have a small technical question on on, mm -hmm. on your spectrum analyzer program. What was the significance of the five point nine kilohertz and five hundred hertz bandwidth? I didn't quite catch that part. So um, basically, you could choose any frequency you like. All, all we're doing is tuning the uh, bat detector. <laughs> um, so, so the um, the sensor is, is giving out a particular frequency, which varies according to the field strength. But let's just call it a, a null frequency. Let, let's say it's 70, 70 kilohertz for the sake of argument. Um, I can tune the bat, bat detector to 70 kilohertz and uh, I would I would hear nothing because it's there's no beat frequency. The frequencies are exactly the same. Um, now, if I then detune the bat detector um, to 
um, 10 kilohertz below that, so 60 kilohertz. There's, a, there's then a 10 kilohertz difference. So I would hear a signal at, at 10 kilohertz because of the beat frequency. Um, I can tune it to any frequency I, uh, I like. Um, I just happen to like something between three and six kilohertz. Um, it just it just feels right, and um, for no particular scientific reason. Um, uh, so I've got it tuned to around about five point nine kilohertz, and you know it, it seems to work fine. I always feel that if if I'm too near the null point, then you know there's not enough bandwidth on that, if you like, to to capture the the spread that might occur as a result of you know some big event. And I don't want to miss it. <laughs> so I want to be far enough away. You also want to be on a flat curve for your um, sound card. So, sorry, Peter, what was that? You also want to have your um, beat frequency in a flat part of the response curve of your sound card. Yes, yeah, exactly, that's right. So you well, don't want to be... You know, rec rec your um, frequency response. Yeah, exactly. So you don't want to be too high or too low. Hmm. Um, and, you know... Below ten kilohertz and above three or four seems to be seems to feel right to me. So that's that's why I do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome, Great. very Great. good. Thank you so much. Thanks, Stuart. So yeah, let me thanks. Get some, uh, yes. thanks, some, guys. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thanks, Stuart. Stuart. <laughs> awesome. So I'm going to do a little housekeeping here. Uh, we're past our little hour but you know we can take as long as we want um i'm sharing yeah so i'm sharing the screen of the uh by the way i'm steven ramsden uh th there's a lot of new faces here i'm the guy that that uh runs the forum um alexandra and mark townley are the ones that actually do all the work um but i'm the one that has the keys to the kingdom so uh we we are doing great on our new uh, web hosting we've got 53 gigabytes of, at of attachments now which I laugh every time I see that because that's about 40 times as much as every other astronomy forum on earth combined. Um, but we uh, have a premium host and we, we spent a lot of money last year to make sure everything ran smoothly. So feel free to put your photos up. Uh, maybe not anything over say a hundred megs or, or 200 megs, but feel free to put whatever, whatever high res photos you want. Um, the database size is 500 megs and that's all the text and the uh, coding and everything that goes along with the text so we've got about 370,000 posts uh everything is running running really smoothly for now i went through and um deleted orphaned attachments a few days ago and an orphaned attachment is one that someone puts in a photo or whatever they want to attach to their post but then the post doesn't go through for some reason or or uh, they forget about it and it times out or whatever. But when, when you when you place a file in your post window to post, it gets uploaded. So um, there's not really, any, I guess, anything we can do about it. Um, uh, but there's a there's already 13 new orphaned attachments. Uh, and I'm looking at them down at the on my other window here and they they total 0.8 gigabytes. So I'm not sure if anybody can do anything about that or not, but that's an interesting thing that comes up. And so when I see an orphaned attachment, I just delete it because uh, it's not assigned to any post and there's nothing that's ever going to pull that attachment up to look at it. So it's just mm -hmm. a waste of space. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if anybody else is having any problems with attachments, but I'd appreciate it if you'd let me know. Mm -hmm. um, do you remember, Stephen, by the way, like years ago, I think when you changed systems, um, all the attachments for the posts, I guess, got lost, right? I mean... This was years ago. So a significant somebody, amount of them got lost, but most yeah, of them so, were still there. Yeah. So, so uh, um, I mean, I was actually looking back at some old posts I made maybe, I don't know, seven years ago or something. And then the posts are there, but the attachments are not. Is it possible if I wanted to, I could go back and reattach the attachments? Absolutely. Yeah. You can do that anytime you want with any post. You can add new files to it. And uh, yeah. And once they get orphaned, there's no way for me to tell what posts they went to. It's just the character names. Uh, the, the names of the files are all just characters that related to the previous database. And, um, you know, there was 20,000 of them at one point. So it's not something I can, I can go in and, and do anything about, but yeah, you can up, you can re-upload posts, uh, 
as long as it's your username, you know, and you haven't changed the username since then. Yeah, yeah. Have at it's it, just man. that the, the, the text is there. The, the, the text is there, but, you know, it says something like C diagram or photo, and there's nothing there because yeah. they got lost at some point. Sorry about that. It's a real amateur operation, and uh, it's just me. So the fact that it even loads every day is amazing. Mm -hmm. But yeah, um, I, that should not happen again, though. And the reason all that happened before is because we went from uh, from a really rudimentary uh, BBS software system. I don't even remember the name of it, but uh, and we were on my my air traffic controllers union servers and we got so big. We were the highest traffic, biggest thing on the entire air traffic controller union servers. And so uh, they were a little bit miffed by that. Um, so I was told to to move it and put it somewhere else. And I changed the software program, which used a different architecture. Um, but we've been around. That's why our, our uh, start date on the uh, board shows on this file is 2014, February 12th, 2014. That's actually when this software started working. We were we actually started the board in 2010. Um, so, yeah, and, you know, I apologize for the amateurish uh, results early on. But I really think we have a professional setup now. And as long as I don't die, um, we ought to be pretty good. Uh, I don't plan on dying uh, soon, but you never know. Uh, so, so yeah, you can, re you can reattach anything you want at any time. I was just going to say, uh, my wife's giving me the, she's giving me the, the curtain like they do on the Oscars, you know, or the Emmys is like, get out of here, get off stage. Uh, 364,000 posts, averaging 110 posts per day. I think that's fantastic, man. And I think we got a pretty, pretty cool forum. It's pretty, uh, you know, there's, there's no knockdown drag outs. I haven't had to ban anybody since Apollo Lasky. And, uh, <laughs> well, I guess I did ban some guy the other day. Uh, who was that guy? He was really dumb. Uh, anyway, I think it's going pretty good. So I am here, uh, and I'm solar chat is my name on the forum. And there's a, there's a, uh, a whole forum in there about stuff that you can report problems with and all that. But I think it's working pretty good. And I wanted to say thank you so much. Uh, we've never had so many people attend these things until Alexandra got the idea of having these presentations. And it really makes me happy. Um, all your smiling faces are wonderful. And especially our Australian, our Australian couple that tunes in at like three o'clock in the morning, man. Um, I was hoping that you might be able to get a wallaby and have it in the living room with you on the next event. Is that something that you can do? We could have a picture of one. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna do. I've got a picture of one. Yeah. We're, we're not the only Australians, though. You can, you've got people who got up earlier than us. Peter over here and uh, Martin are an hour earlier than us. Oh my we, God! Well, yeah. somebody needs a wallaby because when I was there, my wife, uh, I called my wife the second day I was there, and she goes, "Well, how many kangaroos have you seen?" And I said, "Oh, I've seen about 300 of them." And mm -hmm. um, I said, "But none of them were alive. They were all on the side <laughs> of the road, dead." <laughs> so uh i'd like a i'd like a live wallaby if if you don't mind okay i mean is that too much to ask Come on. Uh, that, um we would have to change where we were um oh, okay well how about a, a koala then you know is that all right maybe See, we can also laugh. Yeah. so please do a flying fox would be fine also if you've got some of those a drop bear maybe um hey i can drop there <laughs> drop bear. So Alexandra or whoever, um, snakes. what's that? Peter could get you some snakes from recent times. Yeah, yeah, we had a um, we had the second deadliest snake on earth at our uh, dark sky observing site. Good Lord. Got a bit aggressive uh, last month. So. Mm, let's not do that. Um, <laughs> ne next month, I, I'm, I won't be able to host on my internet. So uh, Alexandra or whoever you want to want to do it. Uh, if you wouldn't mind arranging that for next month's link. Uh, but other than that, the link is always the same. So uh, Pedro, I'm, I'm glad you're here. I hope you feel okay. Um, did anyone else uh, have anything they wanted to bring up? Can you hear me, Stephen? I can, yeah. Ah, but you just I can't, can't see, see you. me. Right. No, I don't know. We'll have some technical issues with the camera. Uh, well, I've seen you before, and that's probably a good thing, just to let you know. Yeah, well, that's true. You have <laughs> I'm teasing. Um, yeah, no, that's that's great. It's my first time, so I'll be back. Yeah, I am really glad that you're here. Um, so maybe Brian can host it on his internet or something next time. I don't know, but you guys work that out. 
Or, or I can host it also, no problem. Ah, you've got some super fast Professor Pedro internet going over there. Yeah. I no do problem. too. <laughs> okay, very good. You guys worked that one out. So um, I recorded everything and I'll be posting a recording of the meeting on, on the uh, solo chat form as soon as it finishes processing. And thank you so much for tuning in. And I guess we will see you again the next, the second Sunday of next month. Steve. So thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you. Someone had something? Thanks. Thanks. Okay. So it's Neef, does it not? Take I will be at Neef. I will be at Neef. Yes. I will be at Neef Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Okay. Um, Bye. Perfect.